Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're really happy to have Jennifer Strauss back again with us here in 2019. Um, she has uh, been fabulous at running our Best Storytime Practices uh, webinar series, uh, both last year and now this year again. And uh, we're really grateful to Jennifer for joining us, as well as the Institute of Museum and Library Services for funding um, such a project as this. So, um, Jen, I've known for, gosh, maybe a decade, <laughs> um, and maybe a little longer. <laughs> um, one of our most fabulous storytellers in all of Michigan. So um, I'm gonna pass this off to Jen to get us started here today by telling us a little bit about herself. All right, thanks so much, Kathy. And hello, everyone. Um, we're recording today. I'm coming to you live from snowy and freezing cold Traverse City, Michigan. Um, I'm in a conference room at our community college, Northwestern Michigan Community College, where I spend some of my time here as a student success coach. So they've helped us with the technology today. and I'm very grateful. So welcome, thank you for spending um, this hour of your afternoon with us to learn a little bit about best practices for story time. Um, I'm a storyteller. I also call myself a narrative consultant, which sounds like a great big hairy title. Um, I don't mean it to sound that way. Uh, the reason I started calling myself a narrative consultant years, again, years ago is that I ended up doing less performance and more of helping, consulting, people find their story, their narrative. So I do a number of things now, but it's been 26 years that I've had this business called Story Be Told. Um, before that, I was a teacher. I taught for 10 years. Um, the last several years of that were in a sixth grade classroom, and they were the ones who taught me about the power of storytelling. Um, they were afraid of reading, afraid of writing, and we started using oral narrative to get to both of those things that year. And by the end of the year, they were embracing writing, they were reading for information and research, and they realized that storytelling was the key for them to embrace language and literacy through reading and writing. So after the last year that I taught sixth grade, I quit my job. And it wasn't because I didn't love those sixth graders. They were my inspiration to see that storytelling is our first language. It's an incredibly powerful tool. It's a way we connect with each other. And for those of us who are working with young people and their families, storytelling is an incredible tool for introducing language and literacy to young people and families. So I hope to be sharing um, today some ideas in our first of four webinars. So I'm gonna move the slide so you can see what the other four are. You can read the descriptions on the Libraries of Michigan website underneath the webinars, um, uh, if you search webinars there. So let's see if I can get this to move, Kath. All right. You might have to, oh, there we go. So there's a little delay in the slide transfer. So these are the four webinars that are coming up once a month, um, sorry, at the end of the month. And um, this is the one we're in today. Story time is your time to shine, the impact of youth librarians on children and their families. Um, February, Touch the Brightest Star, that's the Ready to Read Michigan Children's Book for 2019. We're gonna use that book and a, a bunch of other ideas to sort of get us ready for summer reading 2019. Um, on March 21st, I'm gonna be sharing with you um, a program that I'll be presenting all summer for our theme of space, a universe of stories for 2019. And then our final one on April 16th, um, I'm gonna take three or four stories and show you how to act them out and play with your young readers and their families. So I hope if you like what you see today, you'll join us for one of those other um, webinars and we can learn together um, all winter and on into the spring. Can I just jump in real quick here um, and to note that um, that today might be a little recap for some people on Every Child Ready to Read, the five practices, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we're, we're excited. We need a recap every now and then, refresher, and for some it might be totally new concepts. Um, and then for um, the, the universe of stories, the galaxy far, far away. Um, <laughs> I hope that you guys will especially join us for that one um, because we've got some great programming plans uh, coming up with Jen in that. So anyway, 
um, feel free to contact me if you need the links to register for all of those. Great. So Kathy, can you still see me? Oh, there, my screens are gotten kind of pixelated. You guys still see me? Okay, good. All right, yeah, I'm very excited about um, this up and coming summer reading program. And since 1993, I've been taking your themes for summer reading and building programs for all ages to come into your libraries and present um, storytelling and literacy based programming for all ages in your library. Space has got me really excited because I was a little space geek kid when I was growing up. And so um, come in for that galaxy's far, far away. We're going to have a great time. So let's get started. Yeah, let's get started. So Kath, I don't know if the slides are not, oh, there we go, all right. So I really wanna start with this slide in um, recognizing all of you for the work that you do. I mean, librarians literally save lives, and I mean that with all my heart. Um, as I speak and do trainings all across the state, and I've done some trainings in other states as well, my job is to recognize what you do and people may not recognize how very important you are but you may be a child's first touch and excitement to language and literacy and that starts in story time and so i want to tell you three little stories about how that happened for me when i was a kid and kath if you can get rid of the slides for right now i'd like to be full screen to tell you these stories hey guys so at the age of four, I lived in the city of Detroit, had an older sister who was 10 years old who loved books, although my parents never read to me. One day, my scared, rabbit scared sister of 10 years said, we're going to get on the city bus and I'm going to take it to the library. Leslie was afraid of everything, but together we got on that city bus and we got off at a place called the Sherwood Forest Library in Detroit, Michigan. We went into that beautiful old library. She took me to the children's section and my sister said, you can take home as many of those as you want. And I looked up at her and said, what do you mean? We can take these home? And by the end of my searching through that children's section of that library and with the help of the children's librarian who was there that day, I left that library with an armload of books, struggled up the steps of that bus, sat down and couldn't believe I could take these books home with me. We went home to our bedroom. We dumped him on my older sister's bed, and she spent the rest of the afternoon reading those books to me. That's story number one. Fast forward, um, I'm 10 years old. It's summertime. I'm at Parks and Rec, which was on the other side of the elementary that I went to. I got bored with what was going on at Parks and Rec and wandered around to the other side of the elementary school, and the door to the library was open. I wandered into the library. There were only two other kids inside that afternoon, but there was a librarian. And I walked up to the desk and she said, are you a summer reader? And I said, what's that? She said, oh, we have a summer reading program. Didn't you know about it? I didn't know about it. She signed me up, gave me my own sticker card because that's all you got for reading back in those days was a sticker or a stamp every week. And I said, I don't know what to pick first. She walked me over to a section of the library where all the Laura Ingalls Wilder books were, and she pulled out that first one and said, I think you might like this. But she didn't go over to that section of the library without talking to me about what I was interested in and what I loved. I spent that whole summer reading that series. The next summer, I knew where to go in the summertime. When I didn't want to be at Parks and Rec, I went to the library signed up for summer reading and the second summer it was the same librarian and i was so happy to see her and when i came up to the desk that summer i said well what should i be reading this summer she said i have an idea for you and she took me over again and introduced me to the chronicles of narnia i spent the summer going into the fifth grade more in narnia than i did in my home or in my neighborhood she even had a map on the wall of the library so we could follow on that map where the characters in those books were going magical experiences that i will never forget so you have the power to impact a child and you may not know that you're even doing it on any given day when you give all your wonderful energy to somebody or introduce them to a new book or have a story time that you know just rocked. So here's what I want you to do in the chat box, and Kat's gonna save these. I want you to type in the name of a person 
who affected you as a child and turned you on to books and reading and that whole world of storytelling or the printed word. Type that person's name into the chat box, please. And Kat, we can go back to um, yeah. this slide again. I see Kim saying my mom and dad. Yay! I Sherry Cumler. Okay. Yep. I'm just reading this off because the recording doesn't show okay, that um, okay. I get a transcript. Grandparents, but. wonderful. Moms and dads, so great. Teachers. Okay, great. Mrs. Keller, my wife. Mm -hmm. Lots of great responses. Wonderful. So it's I really remember important to remember who affected you, mm -hmm. right? And just know that you are that person and you just don't know whose lives you're going to change, right? So let's see if we can go on to the next one here. <laughs> there we go. Oops, sorry. Way too fast. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Got a little carried away. All right, now I want you to type into the chat box, I am a master storyteller. Really, go ahead and do that, please. See what that feels like. I am a master storyteller, meaning you, not me, you. Thank you. Thanks, Krista. Yep, good job, I like the capitals. Excellent. Wonderful, you are. So I need to tell you before we go any further, that if you have any feelings of fear or feeling shy about putting a book down and telling a story, I want to help dissolve that during this webinar and all the others that follow. You are a storyteller. The human brain, which we're going to go into here in a minute, is wired for story. Okay? We think, learn, and retain information in images that our brain process into meaning. Okay? So our first language is storytelling. And for all generations, as far back as we could go, story has been the way that we connect and communicate in this world with other human beings. It's how we share experiences. It's how we share lessons, humor. And so you already are a storyteller. And because storytelling is our first language, then that is the basis for all other language experiences for young people. So storytelling is the very thing, or speaking is the very thing that leads to reading readiness, and leads to being able to write later on. And so I want you to embrace the storyteller inside of you today as we move forward through this information. The first place we're gonna go, see how fast these slides move. Sorry for the delay here in moving slides. There we go. First place we're gonna go is inside the human brain, the brain of a young child. And this may be review for some of you, but I hope to explain it in a way that might add a little bit more information than you've already had. So this is the artist's representation of one brain cell or a neuron in a child's brain. And so you can see that cable that whips down the middle, that's the axon. That's what messages in the brain travel on. You see all those branches on the other end. Those are called dendrites, and they're just reaching out to connect with another nerve cell. So, Kath, if you can um, uh, unshare for a minute, I have something I want to show everybody to kind of drive this point home. All right, so can you see these? <laughs> All right, so I took that image that we just looked at, and I used, I used um, fuzzies to make a nerve cell and another nerve cell, because I want to explain something to you, and then we'll look at the data on the slides, and you'll have that for later. When a baby's born, when a baby's born, only 17% of their brain is already wired. Let me say that again, 17%. So when a little baby's born, it's more like the hard drive is already set, 17%. That means that after birth, in all the time that comes after that baby is born, 83% of that brain is going to wire after birth. 83% is sort of like the programs you might load on the computer that you're going to use. Okay? So with that in mind, I'm going to go back to the nerve cells and tell you that when a baby's born, they are born with 100 billion nerve cells in that 17%, okay, 100 billion of these. 
Every one of those nerve cells has dendrites on the end reaching out for an experience to connect to. There are 10,000 dendrites on the end of every nerve cell. So if those nerve cells wired one to one, that would be the possibility of one quadruple connections, but that's only if they were to wire one to one. Neuroscientists have told us that is not how this works. Neuroscientists know that the nerve cells that wire together are the ones that fire together. And that wiring and that firing and development in a child's brain is totally experience dependent. Totally experience dependent. So we're going to go back to the slides, Kathy, so I can show the next one up for everybody to read and, and to see. All right, so there's that nerve cell. And here's the information I just shared for you. Everything that determines those 100 billion neurons to wire with another neuron is experience dependent. It's not moving for me. I'm sorry, you guys, for, the, for that. All right. So there's a time period between zero and five in those young ones. It's called a window of opportunity or a window of sensitivity where those dendrites are reaching out just looking for experiences to wire to. So if the neurons that fire together, wire together, and there's this plot process of blossoming, and those dendrites are reaching out, it's the experiences that that child has will cause them to wire together. The experience that child doesn't have will cause those nerve cells to wither and to go away. It's called the pruning sequence. If a child zero to five doesn't have the right language and learning experiences, then they're not gonna have reading readiness later on. They're not gonna be able to write as well later on. And so experience is what gives them that. So let's talk about what that experience might look like. And these are also, um, the next slides you're gonna see are the same as the five practices and what we need to put into every story time. So let's take a look at those. If my slides will work. It's kind of like those baby neurons. <laughs> Your computer's talking to my computer. Oh. And then it has to right. move. Is that the right one? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the first thing that a child experiences is people talking to them. And as they listen, they read facial expression and emotion and attitude and body language. And they start to perceive language just by listening to somebody talk to them. That's the first of the five principles or practices. A child before kindergarten needs to hear 30,000 words spoken to them, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, not to me anyway. If you were to speak 30,000 words, that would be the same as reading the book, The Cat in the Hat, 18 times. But some children are starting kindergarten without even hearing a part of that many words. So 30,000 words are needed before kindergarten if a child's going to be a proficient reader by third grade. So talking is the first thing that's incredibly important for us to do. Second practice, and these are all going to be in our story times later. I'm afraid to hit the button again. <laughs> Oh, for goodness sake. Okay, I'll just take over the control oh, here. That would be good if it would go quicker because um, there's a lot to share. So talk Okay, to just tell right. me what. <laughs> Second of the five practices is singing because with rhythm and rhyme and singing, it helps that child develop a sense of the way that um, language moves and also syllables. So singing with them is the second of the five practices. Next one. Reading, reading to children, we all know that already. So reading every day and reading out loud, but not just reading, right? Talking about what you're reading, pointing to the pictures, asking questions, wondering about the things in the pictures, and then reading. So engaging that child in a full language experience while you're reading that book. Next one. Writing is the next one, and I've heard librarians ask me and over and over again, I'm doing a toddler story time. 
How am I going to get them to write? But we need to all remember that anything that engages motor function and motor skills at that young age is getting them ready to write, getting them ready to hold a crayon or a pencil. And so I want you to know that writing can be anything that gets ready for that. And some of the craft ideas I'm going to share with you later are a way to do pre-writing skills that are needed later on. So writing together can be scribbling, drawing pictures, pasting, picking up small objects out of the sand, writing letters in the sand or in the air. That's all writing. Let's go to the next one. The last of the five practices is playing. How important it is to have creative play together so that problem solving and role playing can all get that child ready for imagining. So that's the fifth of the practices, of the five practices. Next slide. This is not one of the five practices, although a lot of adults think it's okay to plop that child in front of one of these screens because they're quiet and they're engaged and maybe they can go get something done for a little while. Research tells us that we shouldn't be putting a child in front of a screen at all before the age of two and a half years. The last Kaiser Foundation study tells us that the average American school age child is spending 49.5 hours a week in front of a screen, average. And that's a scary notion when you remember that the neurons that wire together are the ones that are firing together. And if this is the majority of the experience that a child is getting, they're not going to be ready to read, they're not going to be ready to write, they're not going to have a full and well-rounded, balanced learning experience as a child. So let's go to the next one. So these are the five practices, talking, singing, reading, writing, and playing. And our goal is that every story time that you do has all five of those in there. And that might feel overwhelming, but I hope before we're done today, it won't feel overwhelming any longer. All right, so in your packets, you have a bunch of um, handouts. The first one, the first sheet is just a general description of what each of these do. And then I also put two charts that you can read, sort of rubric charts, to show you what each of these practices can do to help a child with um, learning, literacy, reading readiness, writing readiness for later on. And I'll just jump in and say that yeah. those um, handouts are available at the links in your chat box. Okay, so I want to show you um, a handout that I've provided for you, a story time planner that allows you to take a look at the five practices and ask yourself some key questions while you're planning the next story, um, story time. You'll see in the top box that um, I, I always, and I'm sure a bunch of you do as well, I use the same two welcome songs for my sessions. I want them to feel welcomed. I also want them to know that if I come back, they're going to hear that same song that I sang the last time, and they're going to already know it. You're going to see me doing a mohawk for that part of the brain that stores information and knowledge. They already know that song. They feel immediately welcome to your story time. There's something familiar for them, and it's a warm and wonderful feeling. So I always start with the same welcome song. I always choose the topic or the theme, as I'm sure that all of you do. I then ask myself, which books do I love? Which books do I know are going to speak to that theme really well? They can be ones that you have already used. And you might go and look up some others that you might want to use in that story time. So these are books that you're going to list that you're going to talk about, that you're going to read out loud, and then maybe put that book down and tell that story. So one or two or three of those go in that box. I have a box over on the side for community partners. I always ask librarians to ask themselves, who can help me with this theme? Is there somebody who can come in and help with that? Is there someone who could provide maybe some materials for the craft? So I always ask myself, who can I pull in from the community that will help with this theme and help my um, students learn a little bit more about the topic? Middle section, flannel board, puppets, props, and play activities. That's that number five um, of the five practices to play. So ideas go in there. Um, songs with movement, that goes in that box. Writing related make and take, whether they're actually writing or whether they are going to be doing something that is a motor skill, a pre-writing or a readiness make and take or craft activity.
activity. And then finally down on the bottom, the closing song. You guys, to tell you the truth, I have two closing songs that I always use as well for that same reason of wrapping those kids up in a story time where they felt welcomed in the beginning, they feel loved at the end, they've learned a lot, they've sang and read and moved and done some crafts, some writing, they've done all the five practices within that story time. So I designed one today that I'd like to share with you and the next slide is what I put together for today. So we're going to go through this story time and because of our time, I'm not going to um, demonstrate each and every part, but I want to demonstrate parts that I think you've not seen before or new ideas for a book that you all know really, really well. So here's my plan for story time. I'm actually doing this one on February 10th up here. Um, and I'm going to start with a welcome song. So I'll just go through this at first and then we'll get in some of the pieces and actually demonstrate it. Song lyrics are in your packet in the handouts. Um, and there's some other ideas that are in there. If there's any idea that's not in your packet, then you can get a hold of me later and um, we can either talk about it or I can send you more materials. So welcome song. Um, my theme is winter tales to warm your toes because it's five degrees up here today. I've been thinking a lot about winter time. Um, the stories that I chose um, from my storytelling repertoire are ones that I dearly love. There's a story called Fox and Rabbit and it comes out of a book called The Boy Who Lived with the Bears. Um, written by Joseph Grushak. And that's a story that I've been telling for a long time. It's a great young people's story. It's a trickster, trickster tale. And I have a song that goes with it that join me in, uh, in on with it. And also a repetitive line that we say together throughout the whole story. The second story that I chose for this is How Bear Lost His Tail. Um, I've told this one for a long time as well. There's a song, there's participation. There are many versions of that story because it's an old folk tale. So if you want to search it, you're going to find, I found six this morning when I searched it. Three of them were new to me. So that's a story I would choose. Um, I'm going to tell with you the family who lived in a snowflake. It's a paper cut story that I want you to learn. Um, my community partners from Grandma Google, because she knows everything, just like Grandma should. When I um, Googled uh, stories that I wanted to look at for winter stories, that's, that's where I went. There's, um, there's three sites that had 25 wintertime stories that you can share with kids in your story time. And then the hardware store, and you'll see why that was a community partner here in a minute. Um, we're going to take a look at the story, The Mitten, a well-loved and very familiar one, but I'm going to show you two different ways to tell that and some props that I brought today um, that I'll share with you that you can add in the part about playing with story and getting them up and actually playing and role-playing and become a part of that story. Um, the song today is Snowflakes Are Falling. There's another um, Get the Wiggles Out song that I do called I Can Reach, all in your packet. And then um, a couple ideas. There's one, another one that I've added that's not on the, the planner, but a couple ideas for that pre-writing activity. And then a closing song that I usually do. The more we get together, but we're going to do it with sign language. Okay? So I'm going to get up for this part. And you can... Um, Join me if you want. I can't hear you. I'm going to be in here all by myself singing these songs. But um, I want to teach them to you. There's words in your packet. I change them up sometimes depending on what's going on. So this is my most favorite um, welcome song. And Jen, do you want me to try to play along? Oh, <laughs> uh, no. That's okay. okay. We're Great. Good. I'm used to doing this now. You're sort of in a room all by yourself, but it's okay, right? So I know you're out there, right, you guys? I know you're out there listening. So it goes like this. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here to share some stories. I'm so glad we're here. Clap, clap. I'm so glad we're here. Clap, clap. I'm so glad we're here to sing some songs. I'm so glad we're all here. I'm so glad we're all here. I'm so glad we're all here to play with stories. So weird clap, kind of in a weird place, but it gets their attention. And it's welcoming in to share songs, to share stories, to be together. So that's the welcome song. Now the second part of this, um, I wanted to, uh, show you some props and things that I would use for um, 
the bear lost his tail, but I'm not going to tell that whole story. But when I'm doing this story with children, and I'll give you the rundown on it. It's that old folk tale about bear who wakes up after a long winter's sleep and is hungry. But before he went to sleep, all the animals had gotten tired of bear bragging about his tail. And so the repeating line in that story is, don't you like my tail? Isn't this the best tail you've ever seen? Well, those animals get together and they teach that bear a lesson. And it's Coyote on that day that he wakes up that's out on the frozen lake. He's cut a hole in the ice. He's ice fishing with his tail. Bear comes out to learn how to ice fish, ice fish with his tail. But when he puts that tail down in the water with a minnow on the end of it, he falls asleep because he's still tired. And later on in that story, underneath the ice, a great big fish, a large mouth bass, comes along, grabs that minnow, and grabs Bear's tail, which makes Bear jump up off the ice, and he loses his tail. So that's a small, small synopsis. But what I do with, um, in a story time, is I bring puppets for this story, especially if the group is small. And Bear's tail is Velcro to the bottom of a bear puppet. So we can act that out and I actually let the kids be the fish that comes and grabs Bear's tail and they take that tail off when Bear jumps up. So it's one way to interact with that particular story. The other thing I let the kids do when they're playing is I let them wear the Bear's tail and I have one of these for every kid in a story time and they actually tie that tail on so that we can do the part where he says, don't you like my tail? Isn't this the most beautiful tail you've ever seen? So they all have their own tails tied around their waist so that they can do that part of the play and that part of the participation. Okay? So I should stop here and say to all of you that um, when you choose stories for your story time, of course, you're going to be reading stories to them. And you're going to read those stories by talking about what you're reading and pointing and interacting and asking questions and wondering, right, as usual, showing the pictures and taking our time through that story. But I always encourage librarians to pick at least one story where you can put that book down. And you can tell that story because the interaction that happens between you and those little ones, eye to eye, person to person, is very different than the reading process. And it's also an incredible way to build language and literacy. They're with you in a different way. It builds language in a different way when they participate with you in that story. So the second one on my plan is a story that, like I said earlier, it's called Fox and Rabbit. It's a trickster story, but what I love about that one is that Rabbit is the one that ends up tricking Fox. The Little Person Wins, and it's a wonderful story about rabbit making tracks in the snow and tricking Fox so that Fox never catches rabbit for lunch, right? So it's a beautiful, beautiful story. So the one that I want to um, teach you today is called The Family Who Lived in a Snowflake. So you remember folding paper when we were kids, or maybe you've done it with kids even now, where you're folding it into that cone shape in order to make that shape that's going to become a snowflake. So I've folded a fairly large piece of paper, like a, a probably 10 inch by 10 inch piece of paper into that cone. And, and it looks sort of like a, a race car. And I hold it this way for this story. So I want to share this story with you. And um, it's a paper cut story. Kids are fascinated with paper cut stories because they want to see what it's going to end up being at the end. So once there was a family. And in that family, there was a mother. They called her mother. In that family, there was a father. And they called him father. Well, there was an older sister in that family. And they called her, I'm pausing now because they start to catch on, right? sister and there was a little brother and guess what they called him brother now mom was pregnant and there was a new baby on the way and that family was going to be growing soon and so dad decided father decided that if that family was growing he needed to build them a brand new house but father had never built a new house before and he wasn't quite sure how to do it he wanted to do his best and make a beautiful house for the family and so for days and for weeks, all Father did, and I'm grabbing the snowflake, right, is saw and hammer and nail. Do it with me. He sawed and he hammered and he nailed. He sawed and he hammered and he nailed until finally their brand new house was done. He brought the family to see that new house. 
And when they all stood out in front of it, sister said, that's the strangest house I've ever seen. Brother said, Dad, the house looks like a race car. Mom just looked up at the shape of the house and scratched her head. He said, come on in. I want to show you the inside. But then they all looked up and realized that for God, Father had forgotten one important thing about the house. He had forgotten to give the house a door, right? And you let them fill in, right? So dad said, oh, that's right. We need a front door. And he got his saw. And very quickly, he cut a front door onto that house. With the door made, the family all ran inside and they looked through the entire house. And when they came back outside, they said, Dad, it's a beautiful house, but we can't see outside of the house. Father forgot to put something else in the house. What did he forget? He forgot the windows. So he asked sister what kind of window she wanted in her room. And she said, I want a long and skinny window that goes from the floor to the ceiling. And so dad took his saw and cut a window for sister. He asked brother what kind of window he wanted, and brother said, I want a long and skinny window that goes in exactly the opposite direction as sisters, of course. So father took his saw and cut a long, skinny window that went all the way across one of the bedroom walls in brother's room. He asked mother what kind of window she would like in that house, and mother said, oh, honey, I've always wanted a window in the roof of the house. Can you make me a skylight? And father risked his life, but he went up on the slanted roof of that house, and just for mother, he cut a beautiful skylight. Now, they had a dog in the family, and it was sister's job to let that dog out whenever he had to go to the bathroom, and it was brother's job to let that dog in whenever he needed to come in. And because their new house was so strange, brother went to father one day and said, you know, Dad, our house has a lot of cool windows. Can you cut a doggy door on the bottom of the house so puppy can go in and out whenever he wants? And so dad went to the bottom of that house and he cut a doggy door. Now before the baby was born, one night, mom came home from work, dad came home from work, brother and sister came home from school, and they finished dinner and went into the living room. And that night, father said, we're not going to turn the TV on tonight. Brother looked up and said, what? Sister looked up and said, what? What are we going to do if we don't turn the TV on? Dad said, I have a wonderful idea. We're going to lay down in the living room in a circle. Mom's going to pop some popcorn. We're going to lay in that circle and look up through the skylight and the roof, and we're going to tell each other stories. Brother and sister said, what? Father said, please try it. I think you're going to like it. And for the first time ever, they didn't turn the TV on. They laid down in the living room. Mom made a great big bowl of popcorn. They looked up through the skylight, and they started to tell stories. Mom told stories about two little bunnies named brother and sister and all the adventures they had had. Father told stories about space aliens, and he said one day they might land on the front lawn. All of a sudden, brother looked up and said, what's that? Sister said, what are you looking at? Brother said, there's something falling out of the sky. Sister said, that's a different story. Brother said, no, look, there's something falling out of the sky. They all put on their jackets and their boots and their hats and their mittens and they ran outside to see what it was that was falling out of the sky and when they looked up they realized that what was falling were great big beautiful wet sticky and fat snowflakes those snowflakes came down all night long the next day, it was Saturday, no school. They climbed up on the roof of the house and went sledding off of that roof all day long. And this is called The Family Who Lived in a Snowflake. And so you end up with this beautiful snowflake. Okay? So um, I didn't put the words or the narrative to that story in your packet, but if any of you think you want to try this, you just shoot me an email and I will send that whole story to you so you can start learning it. But really, you guys, all you have to remember is that they need a door, they need windows, a skylight, and a doggy door. And you can tell that story any way you want, right? And Jennifer, I'll just add that um, 
I do a very similar one for Halloween with a pumpkin and it right. creates a jack-o'-lantern face. Oh, fun. Very um, fun. There's a, there's a ton of paper cut stories out there and they're so fun and they fascinate kids because there's that anticipation the whole time. Like, what is this going to become and what's it going to turn into? And this one leads well into one of the crafts we're going to do, which is to make snowflakes. I mean, every kid should cut a snowflake at some point in their life. So that's one of the pre- um, uh, pre-writing and using scissors and cutting and taking, a, a, I'll show you in a little bit, taking a coffee filter and making snowflakes that you can then hang up and put the name on them and hang around the library. So, any questions on that story um, in the chat box? You can ask if there are any um, questions that you want to ask me about that story. And also in the chat box, I included a couple of books that you can find on mel.org uh, for paper cut stories. So it doesn't look like we have any questions, if you want. Right. So Kath, I want to go back to the slides because there's one that I didn't show before. I started to get into the story time and I'd like to, um, to the next slide. So that was the planning sheet, right? It wasn't in any particular order. And so many um, new librarians will say, well, how many stories or do you have to do it all in the same story time or how do you do this so i wanted to go through with that I, I should have done that before the paper cut story sorry we did the welcome song i say same song each week or you can change them up for the seasons but again that welcoming song um i introduce the theme or the topic to the group we can talk about what season we're in we can talk about the snow things that you've done in the snow how does it make you feel what does it look like taste like feel like and then story number one so um, either read or tell a story with participation. I told you that my first choice was Fox and Rabbit. Story number two, read and tell another one with different kind of participation. So you can add sing-alongs or call and response or have them repeat lines with you. But you really want to think about how you're going to engage them, whether you're reading that book or whether you're telling that story. You want to engage them in some way that's going to cause them to participate with you. Then they take ownership over the language, the story. They fall in love with it in a different way. Um, Theme-based or get the Wiggles Out song could come next. Um, and so at this point, I want to show you, uh, well, let me go through this, and then I'll show you one um, that I use in just about every story time when you know they need to get up and move just a little bit, no matter what the theme is. Um, an act and play story, um, song, finger play, or rhyme, a play for that play activity, and then a closing song right a closing song and then at the end some kind of writing related activity so usually two stories um, a song you might have another one that's an act and play story um, and then a story finger play or rhyme um, it can be a felt board uh, type activity and then a closing song right um, we're focusing on zero five age for this webinar today not necessarily yep. well uh, melissa was asking what ages do you usually have in story um, times in story and the time, five the five practices we aim at zero to five okay yep. yeah but i still you know i still use those when i'm doing even a little bit older than that Kath. so a zero to five toddler to preschoolers this kind of story time but i use these practices all the way through second grade when i'm presenting so i mean they're good practices you know and and it's not like at some particular age you need to stop singing and playing and reading and writing it's just that you do it at a different level the stories are a little different the songs are a little different you know the level of that of that um child's um, understanding of those stories is gonna be a little different. I still use them all the way through second grade, okay? So, um, so just in, in some form of, of uh, order of events for your story time, so you're mixing things up between songs, movement, um, stories that you're either gonna read or tell, ones that you're gonna use to play with. And so the, the paper cut story, I usually place that in that either another song, a finger play, a rhyme, or another activity type story, all right? So I want to show you now um, another uh, song that I use to get the wiggles out, and then we're going to go into different ideas for the last song, which or the last story, which is the mitten, which so many people use, but I'm going to start, show you some really cool things that you can do with that. All right, so um, we get the wiggles out. I sometimes start with this one. I sometimes do it in the middle. If you think that they're kind of losing it and they need to get up and wiggle during that second story, you see that maybe they need some movement. This is a great one to call upon no matter what the theme is. And it goes like this. You reach way up. I can reach up to the sky. And I have them stretch. You know, you got to stretch it all out. 
So it's, I can reach up to the sky. And then we go all the way down. I can touch the ground. And if they can do it, little froggy action, right? Put my hands upon my hips. Wiggle myself around. One hand up and one hand down. Stretch it out. Do the other side. Then I say, shake the hand of my good friend. Give them a high five. So they shake the hand of somebody near them and they give them a high five. So let's do that one more time. You can get up and do it with me. I can't see any of you, but I hope you're doing some of this because you know as well as I do that wiring in our brains is repetition dependent, right? So here we go. I can reach up to the sky. I can touch the ground. Froggies. Put my hands upon my hips. Wiggle myself around. One hand up and one hand down. Do the other side. Shake the hand of my good friend. Give him a high five. Smack. All right? So play with that. And I always tell all, all the librarians that I'm in trainings with, if you forget the tune, you forget the words, or you just want to practice it with me, call me, we'll sing it on the phone together, all right? So if you want to use that or make up your own tune to it, you can do that as well. So just know that you have access to me from now on for any of the materials. And, and if you have questions or you want to sing songs together, please give me a call, we can do that together. Any questions on that one? So in the chat box, before I get to this one, which is a really favorite story for a lot of people, kids love it, I want you to write, and we'll be saving this, your favorite wintertime or snow story. Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> so for the sake of the recording, I'm just going to read a few of these off. Um, yeah. Sneezy the snowman, the mitten, snowy day, bunny slopes, snowman at night. That's a fun one. Uh, Disney's Do You Want to Build a Snowman? Ooh. Ooh. Have any of you seen Rabbit Snow Dance? That's a Grushak one as well. And then um, Thomas's Snowsuit. How many people are using that one? Hysterical. Oh, good. Very good. So we all have our favorites. And as a storyteller, um, one of the first pieces of advice that I received and one that I pass along to anybody who wants to pursue storytelling or is building story times, you have to love the story, right? You have to love it. It has to have some connection for you because if you love that story and you share it with a group of young people, whether you're reading it or whether you're telling it, they're going to get that passion from you. They're going to fall in love with that story because you love it. And I hope that makes sense, right? So we're going to do the mitten. I saw that three or four times. And um, we're going to tell the mitten. And I'm going to show you three ways that I have shared this story. The first time, we're just going to share it with um, the motions that I've added for all the animals. The second time, Time, we're going to play with that story so I'm going to bring out some props um, the third explanation I won't tell it three times but the third explanation I'm going to show you how you can actually have kids physically become the animals in that story and move into a part of your library that you've created a mitten in and it can just be a sheet that's draped over a couple of shelves right but they're actually physically going to go into that so I've changed some of this and you might or maybe you don't know that the mitten is actually a 350 year old Ukrainian folk tale. Jan Brett's version obviously is the one that captured our hearts because of her language and because of the illustrations in her stories. And she's also gone on to create one called the Hat. And I think there's a few other versions where animals move into something else. So she's awesome. My very favorite version of this is in a tiny little book um, written by another Jan, Jan Tressolt the mitten. And then in my research, I have found many versions of a container that animals have moved into that the story was the basis for. So I've sort of changed it and created a little bit of my own version. But I'd like to share a story with you, and it's called The Mitten, and I usually tell kids how old it is. And before we tell this story, I need to introduce you to all the amazing animals that we're going to meet in this story. Now, the first animal to show up is an animal called a mole. The mole likes to dig underground, and because they dig underground, they have very tiny eyes and a really strange nose. 
Yep. They have fingers on the ends of their noses. So when the mole shows up in the story, I want you to do this. So they're joining in, right, sound effects, and also creating something that's going to help them remember the animal, right, the nose on the mole. So let's do that. Good job. The second animal that shows up in this story is a beautiful snowshoe hare or a rabbit. And a rabbit has beautiful long ears and she loves her ears. She likes to boink those ears like this. Boink, 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 boink. Can you do that with me? Let's boink those ears. Boink, 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 boink. Now the third animal that shows up in this story, I switched it from hedgehog to porcupine because of where we live in Michigan, is a Porcupine. Porcupine's body's covered by quills, really sharp, sticky quills. So when I say porcupine, I want you to get your quills ready right here next to your body. And when I say porcupine, let your quills out like this. <sighs> ready? Porcupine. <sighs> Good job. The next animal is my favorite. His name is Badger. Badger's a big animal, but he digs underground too. He has great big diggers. <laughs> and he says this. Badger's really silly. Can you try that with me? Get your diggers up. Good job. Now the next animal that shows up is a beautiful owl. So I want you to start with owl flying over your head, big circles. Let's have owl fly over quietly. And then she's gonna swoop down, shoop. And she's gonna show us that she has sharp front claws. They're called talons. Let's do it, let her fly over your head. She's coming down, shoop. Now show me your sharp claws. Good job. The next animal is a sly fox. He has a long nose and sharp teeth and he likes to growl. So we're gonna say this when Fox shows up. Let's do it. And finally, the last animal is a sleepy old bear. He's been sleeping all winter, but he woke up and he sounds like this. Ba-doom, ba-doom, ba-doom. Ba-doom. Can you sound like a sleepy old bear? Let's try that. Ba-doom, 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 ba-doom. All right, you ready for the story? I think you are. <laughs> Once there was a little girl by the name of Nikki. And for her birthday, all that Nikki wanted was a brand new pair of mittens, but she wanted white mittens. She wanted them to be the same color as the snow on the ground outside. One day before her birthday, Nikki went to her grandma, only she didn't call her grandma, grandma. You know what she called her? She called her Baba. Nikki said, oh, Baba, it's almost my birthday. Will you make me a brand new pair of mittens? Will you make them the same color as the snow? But at first, Nikki's Baba said, no, Nikki. If I make you white mittens and you drop one in the snow, you're going to lose your mittens. But Nikki begged and she pleaded and she warmed her Baba's heart. And finally, Baba agreed to make Nikki a brand new pair of mittens for her birthday. And they were going to be the same color as the, as the snow. Well, Nikki could hear behind Baba's bedroom door the knitting needles clicking together and clicking together. And she knew Baba was working on those mittens. And on her birthday, Nikki opened a package and inside, guess what there was? A brand new pair of mittens. They were the same color as the snow. Nikki put those mittens on and you know, Baba had made them just right. They fit perfectly. Nikki wanted to go out and see if her new mittens were warm. It was a beautiful winter day. It was sunny out, but it had snowed the night before. As she put on her snow pants. Then she put on her what? She put on her boots. She put on her, yep, she put on her hat and she already had on her new mittens. Nikki went out on that beautiful winter's day and she was running in the snow when all of a sudden, well, her boot hit something underneath the snow. Nikki wanted to see what it was. So she took those mittens off and she put them in her pocket. 
She dug underneath that snow to see what it was. And you know what? She had kicked a beautiful pine cone. It was covered with ice. It looked like a diamond. She said, oh, I'm going to take that home to Baba. But she didn't want to carry it. So she put it down on the snow and she decided she'd pick it up on the way home. She started running again. Only Nikki didn't realize that one of those mittens that she had stuffed in her coat pocket, well, it came out of her pocket and it landed on the snow. You couldn't even see that mitten. Nikki didn't know that she had lost it. Well, that mitten laid on the snow for quite some time when all of a sudden up from the snow came a mole. You guys ready? <laughs> and that mole had been digging underground looking for bugs to eat all morning. And the moles saw that mitten and thought it would be a wonderful place to go inside and get warm. So the mole moved into the mitten. And that mole lay down in the mitten and went to sleep. Now that mole had been sleeping for quite a while. I saw Kathy say we're running a little long. We're going to make it, Kathy. That mole had been sleeping for quite some time when along came the snowshoe rabbit. Boink, boink, boink. And that snowshoe rabbit was so busy combing her fur that she, at first she didn't see that mitten. But when she turned around, she saw that mitten laying in the snow and she thought it would be a wonderful place to take a nap. She turned around and went in feet first. Boink, boink, boink. And inside that mitten, the mole woke up. And the mole looked up and saw that animal coming. And at first he said, there's not enough room in here. So do that with me, all right? Hands up. There's not enough room in here. But when the mole saw the rabbit's big back kickers, he changed his mind. He said, come on in. We'll make some room in here. And so the rabbit moved into that mitten, and the mole and the rabbit laid down, and they both went to sleep. Now those two animals have been sleeping inside of that mitten for quite some time and on came a scruffly old porcupine. You got your clothes ready? Porcupine. <sighs> he had been snuffling through the woods all day looking under logs and leaves for things to eat and he was kind of tired. And he saw that mitten and thought it would be a wonderful place to get warm. So the porcupine moved into the mitten. <laughs> well inside that mitten, guess who woke up? The mole. The snowshoe rabbit, boing, boing. they saw the porcupine coming and said, there's not enough room in here. But then they saw that that porcupine was covered with sharp quills. They looked at each other and they said, come on in, we'll make some room in here. And Kath, I am going to speed this up a little bit because I'm watching the time. So all the animals move into that mitten. And what I do in the middle of this story is when the owl moves in, she lands very quietly, spreads her wings out, and goes into that mitten. And even though they don't really, they can't really hear her, they wake up because of the shadow of her wings. They see those sharp claws and they let her come in. And she covers everybody with her wings like a blanket. So each time another animal moves in, they all wake up and you go through all the motions again. And then they say, there's not enough room in here, but every animal seems to have something about them that lets them say, come on in, I'll make some room in here. Finally, the bear moves in, right? Ba -doom, ba -doom. Those animals all wake up, mole, the bunny rabbit, the porcupine, the badger, the fox, and they don't say a word because no one's gonna argue with that bear. The bear moves in, they all go to sleep. Owl puts her wings over everyone like a blanket, right? And then finally the mouse comes in. And when the mouse comes in, the only spot that's left is right on top of the bear's nose. And it tickles the bear's nose so much, he says, <laughs> cut it out. But then he lets out a great big sneeze. ha -choo! And all those animals go flying on that mitten. The mitten comes floating down just at the time when Nikki's coming home. And she grabs that mitten in midair and puts it on her hand. And it's a little bit bigger than it was before because all those animals have been napping in that mitten. But when she gets home, she can show grandma or baba that she still has her two white mittens. So forgive me for speeding that story up, but I think people are kind of familiar with it. And each animal that goes in the mitten has a sound and a motion that goes with it. They move into the mitten, that mitten stretches out, and then the bear sneezes. They all go flying. 
and that mitten is found again by Nikki, who shows it to Baba, who knows that she still has them. Right? So the other way that I've done this, you guys, and very quickly I'm going to show you, I made this gigantic and mitten, right? Yeah? I just, I just put a note on there that um, we are recording, so if people have to go on desk and such, they'll get a recording link. Okay, about 20 I'm hours. almost done, Kath. I'm just going to show these two. Yeah, ideas. I don't want to rush you. <laughs> I know, you know, I told you, it was like, this needs to be an hour and 15. But I'm a storyteller, so, you know, we always run into that problem. So here's what I did. I work with them um, in Traverse City. I work for Arts for All, and then I go into all the classrooms of, I call them my kids of all abilities. So they're all of differing abilities, and over the years, I've created all kinds of props, but you know what? They work so well with that zero to five story time because it gets them involved. So I tell that story again, but this time when a mitten lands on the snow, it's this huge mitten that I either put on the floor or I put it on a low table where everybody's gathered around for story time, right? And I hand out, and this is where I said the community partners, I went to the hardware store and they gave me all those paint stirrers. And then um, in your slides, uh, you can go online and just Google Jan Brett free printables and get these, right? They can be masks or they can be this, right? So I hand them out to all the kids. And when it comes time for that mole to move into the mitten, well, that's the kid that comes up and puts that mole into, into the box. So this is a cardboard box, right? So there's an opening that's easy for the kids to put that puppet into it, but it's also a mitten that's been put around that cardboard box. So they come up and they put that animal in while the rest of the audience is still participating by making the sounds and the motions for every animal. They hand these out. So when the bunny rabbit comes up, everybody's still doing the blanky ears, but that particular kid can come up and put the rabbit into the box. And they love doing this. So paint sticks, copy these uh, um, free printables off of um, Google, you know, just Googled it. And um, there's some of those in your uh, slides that shows the picture of it and shows you, I think, where to go and, and search that, right? So this is a really fun way to do it. The other thing I've done, like I said earlier, is that um, I've actually... The disabled kids don't like to wear masks because there's a lot of problems that there's some fear and, and there's some things around having their faces covered up sometimes just because of their physical situation. So I did this, I put them around them like this and they actually move into a physical mitten. I just drape sheets around either a, a fabric rack or a couple of shelves. So these are incredible for them to participate as well in that play part of the five practices. They actually become the rabbit, they can bounce, they can have that nose, they can move into that physical mitten and hide out in there and pretend that they're sleeping. And then the bear has the job of sneezing and everybody has to run out of that mitten and scatter. So it's a really lovely way to get them involved this way for the play part of that. Any questions on that part? And I did share in the chat box, it's janbrett.com. You can access all these free printables on. Yeah, they're wonderful. I mean, they're just beautiful, right? And all that style, the illustrations that if you read the book with them, you'd be talking about those illustrations and how they add to the feeling of that book. And there they are again. And I thank her so much for sharing that with us because the kids love these characters. They just absolutely love them. Right? So um, I'm going to end with just one little song. You have two versions in your packet, but it, I had um, teenagers help me. <laughs> we have peer, peers that help with the kids of all abilities, and they cut the, the snowflakes out, but you can have your kids do that if they're a little bit older, and paint sticks. And I hand these all out for the singing and, and movement part of it, and we do a snowflake song. So I'll just do a couple of verses of it. It's all in your packet. But they all have snowflakes, and you sort of guide the movement, right? Snowflakes, snowflakes falling down. Snowflakes, snowflakes falling down. Snowflakes, snowflakes falling down. Falling to the ground. Snowflakes, snowflakes spinning around. Snowflakes, snowflakes spinning around. Snowflakes, snowflakes spinning around. 
falling to the ground. So they all have snowflakes, and then you can come up with just as any verses as you want. There's two other song versions in your packet, but I'll have them come up with it. What else do snow, snowflakes do? They drift. Snowflakes, snowflakes, drifting down. What do they do? Well, they fly down. Snowflakes, snowflakes, flying down. So it's movement, it's song, it's rhythm, and participation with these. So that's a song I often do with the winter theme story time. All right. So if we can go back to the slides, Kat, there's just two more that I'd like to show everybody. Um, we'll go back one. There we go, okay. So yeah, go back to the Jan Brett pictures, please. Oh no, one before that, sorry, <laughs> one before that. So we've talked a lot about how to add the five practices into a story time. I hope that planning sheet will sort of help you get organized and that the other slides about what order to do things in will help as well. Um, but I encourage you to use all five of them and you're gonna see that your story times are gonna come alive and you'll have more participation. The other thing you're doing, you're modeling for moms and dads and caregivers how to engage kids in language and literacy without having to spend a lot of money, without having to do a lot, right? So I hope that these will help you. Let's go to the next one. There's the, um, you know, that what um, uh, Kathy had shared, the, the Jan Brett free printables. So I hope you'll engage with those. Here's the five practices again. Please think about them the next time you're planning a story time. And finally, if you need me, because this is a very short time period to share in, please call me, please email me. Um, you have lifetime access to me now if you participate in one of my trainings that you can call and ask any question you wanna ask or get help with any of this. You're allowed to use any of the ideas that you saw today. I didn't share with you the writing part, but um, I wanna share with you, and if we can go back to full screen again, Kat, just the two ideas that I brought then we can ask for questions. So um, coffee filters, I'm sure you've used these for things before, right? So um, having them fold them in that cone shape that they saw in the family who lived in the snowflake and cutting, they could do it the same way as the story. You could actually do it together and have them cut the door. Of course, you'd have smaller scissors than this and have them cut. If they're not ready for scissors, you can have them tear pieces out of that so that they can create that snowflake and maybe even retell that story to a grown up who's with them or to each other so that they can make snowflakes that you hang around in the library. The other thing that I've done with the little ones, usually as a, a project between caregiver, mom, dad, or caregiver and the little one, is given them either foamy mittens, two of them, or felt where I have already cut the holes in it, you know, the lacing idea, and I have them make their own mitten by lacing it up, and then I have those printable characters really small that they can color and put into the mitten and take that home with them so that they can tell that story again. So I'm um, actually stitching up that mitten, right? And it's um, a plastic needle and the holes are already cut in there so that they can have that motor skill function of stitching that mitten up and then go home with all the animals to go inside to retell that story again and again because we know repetition is everything. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so if That's really fun. Um, that anybody has, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thanks for staying for the full hour. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, if you have any any questions, please do put them in the chat box. Um, and I shared Jennifer's uh, contact information in the chat box, as oh, well please. as don't forget your survey. Please um, fill out that survey so we continue to report to the Institute of Museum and Library Services and bring you great webinars like this one today. So, I hope that it helped. I know it was really fast, but I also know librarians are really good at picking up ideas and running with them. So I hope that you saw something today that you can use right away. If not, think about the five practices in your story times that are coming up. Right? And yeah. um, Jen, did you mention those um, movements that you did for each of the animals in the story, the mitten? That version was Jan Trussellet. That version with the motions in it's me. You. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So but what based I, on... when I grab a story out of like if it's traditional story out of folklore or whatever, my head's automatically saying, can where am I gonna put the repetition or where am I gonna put the participation in? What part of the story can I bring them in on? How am I gonna have them repeat lines? How am I gonna create a song that goes with this? So that's automatic in my head. So this all just came because of me. I can't stop moving my hands. So it's like 
you know, I knew the, that this was the mole and the rabbit and the porcupine, so it gets them um, involved right away. If you want me to, um, if you want me to go through those uh, with you, how can we do that, Kath? I mean, we have this, we have this recorded. Yeah, this is is recorded, and I was just curious if they were in your handout, but I that, think it's important. It's not in the handout. I think you hit on a point, an important point because you're saying, you know, you're adapting these stories with what you're comfortable with, and right. that really helps you to go off book um, right. because it's something you're comfortable. So if they want to make their own characters do their own things, um, that's yeah. perfectly okay. Right. Yeah, letting the kids do that, or like reading that that version and doing another version and reading another version, and then and then play acting your own version. All of that's going to help them understand, you know, um, versions, language, um, interpreting language, becoming part of that story. Right? Wonderful. Well, I don't think we have any other questions on here um, today, but thank you so much, Jen. Thank you. Love Jen. having you. I hope to see you at the next one, which is on yeah. um, February 21st, and we're going to engage with that Touch the Brightest Star, you know, the book this year. Yeah, very excited for that. So, all right, everybody, I am going to stop our recording. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs>